Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rob Sherman. I'm a VP at Meta. Um, and one of the things, and what we're here to discuss today is the future of XR and how it's going to impact education. Um, as you can guess from my affiliation, I am not an educator um, by training. I come from a long line of educators um, and so feel very strongly about the value of the work, but um, come from the perspective of building technology that can be used to help improve education and can be a tool to help improve people's lives. Um, and so the reason that I'm here is really because I think education, maybe singularly, is the space where we have the most opportunity to use this emerging technology to change the way people learn and to change the opportunities that they have, that, that they have in their lives. And I'm really excited to be here with really a world-class panel of experts in education technology who are thinking about how augmented reality and virtual reality can help revolutionize the space. Um, I want to dig, there's a lot that we can dig into today, and I know that XR and metaverse is a, a topic that we've been having a lot of conversations about, um, but one of the things that I think is important to get into and what I hope we'll dig into in this discussion specifically is to move beyond the talking points about the, you know, the virtual reality and augmented reality and the, and the value of that technology. I think, you know, many of us who are here are excited about the promise of new technology, but what does it actually mean in practice? What are we talking about um, when we say that we're, that, that this technology is valuable for education. What does it take to achieve that value, and what are the and what are the things that we need to do now in order to enable it? So I'm really so there's a lot to discuss as we unpack that and really try to get very concrete and actionable about both what the promise is and what we need to do to get there. And so we're going to skip past the introductions and all of the sort of who builds what, and I think we'll get a sense of the expertise of the panel as we get into it. Um, but Josh, maybe I could start with you um, and. Let's kind of fast forward to the future. If you look 10 years out, 2030, 2033, what, is, what does education look like in that time and how is it different from what we're experiencing today? Huh. Well, I guess... It's a um, small question. Yeah, I was going to say. I th well, in some ways, I think the way I would answer that is um, I don't know, none of these people know, and none of you know, and in some ways, that's what's most interesting about this moment in the history of education, that um, if you had asked that question of any of us 20 or 30 years ago, I think we would have said, we know exactly what schools are going to look like in, in 50 years. They're going to look the same as they've looked for the last 300 years because they were built to optimize one mode and technology of um, information exchange, the printed book, and maybe the, the, the um, synchronous verbal lecture. Um, and now over the last couple of decades, even before any of us got going on, or certainly I got going on this immersive media, we have such a proliferation of channels um, and delivery devices and storage systems, and now a new one in this immersive media that um, I think it's very hard to say what, what schools are going to look like in, in 30 years, and uh, for the first time it's hard to say that. I think one thing is, um, I think most everybody up here would agree, um, school is not going to be a bunch of people uh, sitting in their basements with a headset on. And, um, and the interesting questions and challenges for all of us are how does this medium and channel for delivery start to intersect with, interact with, become compatible with lots of the others, including books. And, um, and schools are going to have to start to rearrange themselves to make all of those handoffs between our little mobile devices and tablets and laptops and books and, um, and headset delivered uh, rich media work in a seamless way that it definitely does not work <laughs> in a seamless way today. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say, which is not really a, a, a prediction or a forecast because I'm studiously avoiding that, um, having to answer that question, uh, is that um, at our company, Dreamscape Learn, uh, I'd say the, the thing that we're most focused on is the handoff between immersive media and other media. And so our flagship product is a, um, an intro, a replacement for the intro biology lab, both in higher ed and in K-12. And uh, there are about 200 minutes of VR in that program, but for every 10 or 15 minutes in VR, the students are two or three hours in pretty traditional classroom environment learning the math and science they need to learn in order to um, sort of play out their role in the, um, in the immersive narrative that, is, that drives the product. And I think getting 
that right, the way that we go back and forth between the, what the immersion can provide and what all the other sort of channels and, and, and media of learning, communication, understanding is, is the big challenge. And, and you know, M Michael Jensen, maybe I can, I can ask you to jump in here too, because I think, um, you know, Josh talks about this idea of, you know, the, I think you started by saying none of us know, and I think that's, that's the honest answer, but when I look at, the, or the, at, at the, the companies that are represented up here and what you're building, the, the future actually looks different when I think about each of what your visions are. Um, so, I mean, paint us a picture of, of your company, Labster, and, and as we're thinking about it, is, it, are, is the future like, we're, you know, is, is the future like we're all in virtual, virtual science labs and we're just using our headsets to do the chemical experiments versus being in a classroom, or what, what are we talking about? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Eileen actually in the previous session said it really, really well that we, we need to distinguish between the um, different types of benefits you can gain from XR and apply it in a very thoughtful way to solve specific challenges. And so uh, so I agree with everything Josh said as well. I think it's important to really understand uh, that the VR is not going to replace everything. It's going to be a mix of different modalities. And so what we found through our research, for instance, is that VR can actually be very damaging to learning in some cases. Uh, you have scenarios where students get into a virtual, very immersive, impressive environment. They're you know, wowed by this incredible world that they're suddenly entering, uh, so much so that they forget about the learning or they get distracted by all the things that are happening in this world. Uh, there was also mentioned here in the last session that like, you need to really design these VR experiences very, very well. Um, and so what we actually found is that a lot of, let's say, protocol-based training in science benefit very, very little from VR. Uh, in fact, sometimes damages the learning. But if you have learning where you need to have an emotional connection, for instance, all our nursing training uh, with patient interact interactions is a fantastic example where most training could actually happen in VR because you can suddenly present the students with emergency scenarios that simply just wouldn't be possible or too expensive or time-consuming to do in the real hospitals. Uh, and that's obviously a very massively growing challenge in the world. Uh, so I think there are many applications where we'll see VR play a massive role and, and maybe even to a large degree be the majority of the training and preparation for real-world exams, um, just like flight simulators are today. And then there are other cases where I think VR will play a very little role, um, be more... Um, I, I actually really admire the Dreamscape case where it's actually, as I understand it, but challenge me if I understand it wrong, it's, it's about creating curiosity and excitement for the students in the topics and then leverage that benefit from the VR experience so that when they go out into the real world or, or the traditional learning environments, they're more excited and, and can apply the, the thinking to, to those environments. So again, an example of really understanding these emotional, this emotional impact you can have on students in the VR environments and focusing on leveraging that as opposed to other cases. And if I can add just a little bit on the, the long-term perspective, so I, I like to think far into the future, think a lot about it. Obviously now with GPT and everything that's happening in generative learning, um, we will see also a massive evolution in generative 3D immersive worlds or learning in 3D immersive worlds. So that's something we are already working on and, and super excited about how that's going to allow us to dramatically, or dramatically scale the application of high quality VR learning experiences in the future. And you can even imagine a world where in these virtual worlds you will have the NPCs or the virtual characters become uh, semi-intelligent so you can actually collaborate with AI agents in these virtual worlds that gives you both collaborative training but also gives you the skills of the future. We need to learn to work with AI and I think actually XR could play a, a very exciting role in, in that as well. So I, I think you said something interesting and maybe a little bit provocative, which is, you know, XR is not the solution to every problem. Um, I, I'd be interested for the, for the other panelists, like, do, do folks agree with that? Are there specific things that you think um, that this technology is helpful for? Are there specific places where you don't think it should be used? I can, I can take that Go one. Um, so, um, I mean, a lot of what we did at Inspirit came from our roots at the virtual reality lab at Stanford, and one of our co-founders has this framework called the DICE model, which many of you might have heard about as well, which really looks at using VR for topics and themes that are either like things that are dangerous to do in the real world, impossible, counterproductive, expensive, or rare. And the, the rubric really, I mean, at least the approach that we look to take, and I think 
people should be taking is not to ask the question of how is VR or AR or XR an incremental improvement over video or whatever the previous thing was that we were doing. A better question to ask is like, what does it unlock that was just impossible to do before um, for learning? Because fundamentally, if you look at learning, um, the way people learn, and, and we look a lot, a lot at STEM education specifically, the way people, people learn STEM today is passive, pedantic, someone is talking at them, not talking to them, there isn't an, that whole dimension of curiosity, exploration, discovery is missing. Um, and the ramifications of that are pretty evident and very, very obvious today. Um, we focus on K-12, and I think a big factor in sustaining this future is going to involve really thinking a lot about the pedagogies and the curriculum around how you can better design with teachers, how you can better integrate with kind of existing lesson plan structures and, and, and existing resources and methodologies that are being used, um, and what are new methodologies that you need to pioneer um, to drive desirable outcomes. Now, so to line up with what Josh said as well, like things like the timing of delivery of a VR experience, is it the hook? Is it to do the formative assessment? Is it something in the middle? Is it a hybrid of these things? How does one seamlessly go in and out of the immersive experience? Um, looking at things around um, curriculum alignment, curriculum standardization, like how does one think about implementing the standards, and especially in a K-12 context where that's so important and critical. And then even from a learning outcomes perspective, most people today really are just talking about outcomes of engagement and maybe some things around training, and this is also a large relic of the advancements in corporate training and kind of uh, lifelong learning with VR and AR. But when you look at learning in a K-12 and higher ed context, I mean, there's all sorts of other learning outcomes that we need to unpack and think a lot more about, like the cognitive aspects, the affective aspects on like emotional changes, attitudes, self-efficacy, um, student agency, confidence, um, uh, collaboration, participation, which we know have direct impacts on retention of test scores and standardized tests and all the other metrics that are uh, better understood. And I think not enough work is happening there at scale. Most work is just a pre-test and a post-test. And uh, my vision for AR and VR in the future is not necessarily replicating a classroom and having kids meet in a digital classroom, I think it is pushing the boundaries even beyond that um, and looking at those opportunities where you can do things that are just impossible to do in the, in the real world. And we have to move beyond the hype of the buzzwords that we are dropping around today um, with these technologies and think really about specific grounded instances in learning. So I think this is a really important and interesting point, right? If we think about, when I think about VR and, and in the future AR as a platform and as technology, I think about the idea of presence, the idea of being someplace that you aren't, couldn't otherwise be or being with people that you could, couldn't otherwise be with. And I think this conference is, is maybe the beginning of an example of that. There's a reason we're all here versus watching these conversations on YouTube. But, but I think to your point, Aditya, like, they, that's a very nascent and very early version. If all we're doing is we're taking classrooms and putting people in a virtual space so that they can listen to the same conversation, same lectures that they listen to, um, that's a very early version of, of what we can do. And I think your, your comments on, on sort of pedagogy and, and curriculum, um, I think are a really good transition to, to where I'd like to go to next, which is, you know, if we accept that all of what we've just talked about, the technology is valuable and that the enriched learning experiences we can offer are, are attainable, what does it take to get there? And, and I'd love to actually start with the curriculum and, and pedagogy question. Um, Aditya, what do we know right now about what is effective? Because for us to update curricula, for up to, us to update the way that we teach and the way that we think about learning, we need to understand whether it's an effective learning modality. I mean, I'll keep it short, but I think there's a lot we can learn from the early days of adoption of other technologies, like the early days of the computers, like the Apple computers of tomorrow. Those were the first PCs in like the 90s and the 2000s that came into schools, like this idea of building a computer lab, which was seen as a heavily burdensome thing for teachers and for school leaders at that point. They were like, why, why the hell do I need this technology in my classroom? The way I teach is perfectly fine the way it is. And then you you develop use cases. You are never going to have one-to-one -one in the early days of any, th any new technology. So thinking about the models of sharing, of usage, of role-playing, of turn-taking, um, of uh, the timing of delivery of these experiences. I think there's a lot of um, models of experimental work that has happened in that era that we can look at replicating um, in, in today's um, day and age. Um, what we know, um, I think VR is really good at, 
um, is certainly this element of, I mean, coming from that idea of presence, I think VR has this really profound opportunity to, to foundationally influence one's emotional or affective uh, leanings towards a topic. It can really be good at this perspective taking piece, which is giving you, putting you in the shoes of a certain experience or a vantage point to learn something. And really kind of the, a, teach, a teacher once kind of called us the magic school bus for the classroom, which is this ability to kind of go to places that are just impossible to go to in the real world and have you visualize and, and experience what it would be like to be inside the human body as a microscopic cell or whatever it is. And I'm just talking about science and STEM examples. I mean, you can extend this beyond on to all the other fields of learning. Um, uh, for teacher training, teacher professional development is a huge area of focus for us today. How do we onboard teachers, uh, reduce the friction and the tension that comes with the loaded nature of these words, VR, metaverse, all of these things have a lot of history and baggage with them and um, thinking about how we can better onboard and support teachers, how can we center um, this also on um, empowering them to succeed because and not threatening them with kind of replacing anything that they do or that they uh, or, or that they feel would be burdensome for them to adopt. And, and Vijay Rajendran, I, I wonder if you can you can also talk with us a little bit about the work that you're doing because I think your your company is a really good example of the promise of this technology and how it can help give di differentiated educational experiences to different people. What, like, where do you see the future going when it comes to yeah, that? So, you know, Florio works in the education context, in special education, teaching social skills, helping kids who have challenges like autism and have IEPs and identified areas where they need to grow. Um, I think the IEP is actually a really interesting construct when you think about the future. What is it? It's an individualized education plan that lays out what is best for this specific child based on intensive analysis by experts on what they need. Why doesn't every kid have an IEP? Yeah. And, and so if you extrapolate out the construction of that, which today is a highly laborious process, there's gonna be great innovations, you know, such as companies like Marker Learning you know, that are coming up with new, quicker, efficient ways to construct that. But where does that lead? It leads into personalized instruction. In our case, that instruction is critically important social skills to create the foundation of development so they can learn in the classroom and receive that meaningful education that the IDA Act. And so, you know, when, when I look at that umbrella, for us, it's around about how to teach the child to cross the street safely, how to invite the child to sit, uh, a friend to sit next to them at the lunch table. Virtual reality is a really powerful construct to create an immersive practice environment that can be repeated with instruction, delivered both remote and in person, and as the tool set improves, which we expect over the next few years, to be done in social group settings where children of comparable abilities might be disparate across a school district, but participating to direct to, to, together. You know, once a week I spend about an hour in a parking lot in Rockville, Maryland, while my son gets group therapy. It's highly laborious to get to group therapy, but as a father of a child on the autism spectrum, it's extremely valuable in his social development. And virtual reality allows us to make those types of uh, things affordable, which today are extremely expensive. And I mean, I think this question of scaling, so I think we've talked about the benefits of what we can build and how it can be helpful for different kinds of use cases. But Emily, I wonder if, I wonder if you can talk with us a little bit about what does it take to scale this technology? And if we believe in it, what does it take to move from something that is nascent and that, and that we can provide on a one-off basis to something that everyone can use? So one thing that I you know, mainly focus on is how are we going to create all this content, all this immersive learning content? All of the companies that are here are creating content you know, every day as their business, but this is going to be very key because if we're putting this technology in the hands of teachers, they're going to need to have some things to do with it and interesting things. And my vision, and when you were asking for the future in the next 10 years, is how are we going to make that content creation more accessible and more democratized where the students can do it, the teachers can do it, uh, publishers can get into it. And I can always see, see in the next 10 years, it's gonna be as easy to create a video or create a website and with AI right now, you can do a lot of things, but you're gonna be able to create a virtual world, a virtual lesson, 
in a couple of minutes and set that up and get your students in, and that's going to help a lot with scale because it is still, you know, it's costly, it's expensive. Um, sometimes, you know, in when I talk to other tech companies or schools that want to get this in, they're a little scared about the aspect of all that content that we need to create. It sounds very high end, it sounds very expensive, but it is going to get there and probably way before 10 years. And another point I'd like to make is, in the next 10 years, it's gonna be the Roblox generation that's coming in. They are gonna be their workforce, they are gonna be there, they are gonna be used to all these things that, you know, I'm, I feel old already even though I'm not yet, but that's, what, that's who's going to be working and these are also gonna be the new, you know, the new teachers out there that are teaching all these things. So they're gonna be a lot more accommodated to being there and using this technology and, you know, instead of just creating your Google slide and presenting it, you might just be whipping up your virtual class and your, you know, physics lesson and get your students in there and be creative. So something I love about the work that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Josh. Well, I was just going to say, I think um, Emily's totally right that as the creator tools mature and, and she's at the uh, sort of bleeding edge of that, um, that will accelerate adoption. But we are so far from having this stuff truly implementable in the ways that the other computing tools we use are. And like, no offense to Meta, but like, what it takes to put your, you know, your quest on and get started, and st like, that just isn't compatible with the way classes have to operate. And whether they should or shouldn't operate in 45-minute blocks, they do. And like, that figuring out everything from the mobile device management and getting into applications faster and having a kind of operating system layer for this stuff that is easy to use and kind of infallible, like we are a million miles from there. And like that's a lot of the important work that has to get done to make this stuff start to permeate schools. Yeah, and not I'll, be, I'll not totally be second that for, you know, teachers takes them, if it takes them, I don't know, three weeks to get into a headset, like we, we missed something, right? <laughs> If, so I, I think this is a, a really important conversation, and, and can, I actually can wanted... I quickly add, add also to that because I do think we can learn a lot from the nursing programs because yeah. we we tested out VI in a lot of different settings and, and courses, and what what happens to be the case in in terms of nursing training programs is they already have these mannequins set up, they have simulation directors not using let's say VR simulations but actual physical real world simulations, and there's many many years of practice of actually doing that. So we find that the adoption within institutions that are teaching nursing programs would be surprisingly frictionless and easy. Uh, in fact, they immediately take ownership of it. And so, so what I would love us to see, and what I think we certainly need to train the other uh, course programs in within STEM and other fields, of course, is take those learnings, those experiences, and help educate other departments as well in, in using it. So I just add that that was from our experience. In fact, we scaled down on a lot of the biology, chemistry, physics uh, in using VR because of all of these adoption challenges. However, in nursing, we are seeing a massive uh, excitement and, and um, buy-in immediately from, from the institution. So, I, I, I mean, I think something that's interesting, and Emily, you mentioned this, Adit, you, met, you mentioned it in a slightly different context, is this idea of, you know, us being on the cusp of something new. And I think that's a really powerful and interesting concept, right? So, Adit, you, you talked about, you know, being, you know, when, when many of us grew up, we got our first computer in the classroom and now it would be kind of unthinkable to have education without computers and I think this is the next phase where where you know we're on the cusp of that and then Emily on the content creation side you also talked about you know the the idea of using generative AI which I think has been we, we have to have we have to use that buzzword at least once in this panel or we won't at be least able to, once yes that's it um, but but I mean I think that's really true like when you think about what it takes for this to get to something that is big that everyone in this room and everyone in every classroom can use, you shouldn't have to have a software engineering master's degree in order, in, in order to build and in order for kids to create. Um, and so I think the technology that allows a teacher or a student to, to create a virtual space dynamically and in real time is really powerful. But I wanna actually dig into some of what we just talked about, like what are the barriers? And, and so we've talked about two. I think one is, is one where, where your company, Emily, is very focused, which is content creation and enabling that to happen. I think we talked about another one, which is an area where, where my company, Meta, um, has, has been investing, I think needs to invest more in enabling the kind of educational use, a, a, a deployment at scale that we're talking about. And I think, you know, and, and then I think um, we talked, uh, Michael, 
you talked also about the training and education and how can we scale helping school districts and helping teachers learn how to do this um, in a way that recognizes it's not their full-time job to um, build and deploy technology. What are the other barriers? Like, what are the things that, that what are the mistakes that we're making right now um, that are making it hard for this future to come true? Vijay? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that is overlooked across all of the applications because of, is the data that is potentially possible to capture to help inform, you know, the best assessment of how someone's doing, where they need help, so, you know, to use our specific example, you know, we're creating content that on the healthcare side is therapy and on, on the education side is used for training in the special ed context. And there's incredible signals in, you know, gaze stability, fixation, um, uh, you know, heuristic timings around different actions. And, you know, we lack the type of sophisticated infrastructures we have in traditional web computing today to capture that, to index it, to search off of it, to you know, basically have common strategies of how to data warehouse that and be able to then analyze that later. So you see kind of that we basically have built a front end technology up to this point without the enterprise backends that we're used to in all these other computing environments. Well, and also we built a front-end technology that you can maybe wear for 20 minutes before you lose your mind. <laughs> you need to take it off of your head. And so, like, there's just limit, like, we're in such a primitive, it's incredibly exciting, but it's such a primitive tool compared to where we will be in even just a few years in terms of, like, whether we're wearing glasses or wearing a helmet. And, um, and once you can have the lenses on for an hour, you can do all kinds of things you can't do now. And I think that's really limiting. And um, anyway. Yeah, and to add to that, I think a lot of people have been burned by AR and VR in the past, or poor AR and VR in the past, and when you get burned once, it becomes very hard to bring them back in, into that experience. Um, for instance, um, we, um, like, I mean, the example that a teacher once used was like, well, if the movie hall has poor audio or poor lighting, then the movie sucks, and then I think it's a bad movie. Um, and so as, as content providers, as curriculum developers, the onus then falls on us to also be responsible for the hardware, the interoperability of the hardware, the device management of the hardware, the procurement and the shipping and the distribution of that and the servicing um, of, of all of that that goes along with it. And, and then, of course, on the privacy and the safety front, too, like COPA, FERPA, GDPR, like we are woefully behind on trying to understand how uh, because of new forms of data that can be collected in these environments and new kinds of kind of questions on identity and PII and all of that that um, become very important when you work with kids. And fundamentally, these devices were not designed for um, learning, um, and I think that is the challenge. I think we might have to be really thinking foundationally about what does, and, and I think a lot about K-12, like what, what are the what are, the, what are the different features that we have to be designing for and building for that do not just become part of the customer support or the training, but are implicitly designed in the hardware and in the form factor of, these, of the next generations of these tools? And yeah, one thing I, I, would, I would jump on, on on that side of things as well is we're, we're always, always thinking about the teachers are going to be scared of this, or you know, it might be hard to get my teachers to get into this. That's what I hear a lot. I was talking to superintendents this morning, and what we found out, and we work with teachers every day. That's well, that's the approach we've been doing. We just work with them. They're in school and they're doing their thing. Is they actually some of them have headsets and they're excited about this stuff, but they have absolutely no support at all from you know the school itself or the district. And so I feel like there's something that we should really be doing. All right, the teachers can be excited. They're not, you know, it's not that hard to get them into it, but then they need all that support and make it much easier for them to actually implement that at scale. And sometimes you'll have one teacher doing, you know, a VR class, and then they want to, you know, they're talking to someone else and they want to do that as well. But then it makes, it's makes so, it's so complicated for them to actually implement that for real. And so I, I think there's some kind of blocker that's happening more on, you know, on the district side, on the training side, on the policy side, and then also getting you know, the IT department up to speed on how these things work. Can we also talk, I, I think a couple of folks have mentioned in different ways the idea of regulation um, and, what, and, and the challenge. I think it, you, you talked about privacy, reg, different kinds of privacy regulations, and that's obviously a place where I, I, I personally spend a bunch of time. Um, but you know, I'd love to understand, and, and Vijay, I know you, you work in the FDA-regulated space as well, um, 
what does the regulatory landscape look like for this technology and what do we need to do to make the regulatory landscape catch up to the promise that we've been talking about? I mean, I think it's, it's complicated because there's so many different standards, especially if you're straddling different industries. But even in the education context, you know, state to state, school district to school district, you run into different types of requirements around, around data retention and, and account management that are problematic um, because of the difficulty in integrating some of the standards used else out, outside of VR into the VR experience. Um, so, I mean, for us, on top of that, we are in the healthcare space needing to comply with qualified healthcare providers using us in a billable healthcare service and um, looking at, you know, eventual FDA approval and going through a pivotal trial and meeting FDA quality standards. So it's, it's a maze of uh, figuring out how to architect the product in a way that, that doesn't create a total maintenance nightmare across all the different implementations while also adhering and being able to hold up to the rigor of, of the different evaluating bodies that, that come up. So, you know, eventually I would hope that, uh, that, you know, the companies like Meta are able to help put some of those standards in, but there's gonna be a few companies that end up probably having to break that ground um, that are startups trying to get their business to work um, to push that through to the level of detail needed to succeed. So I, I think the, these are all really important sort of like what do we as a community need to do and, and it sounds like there are a lot of different pieces for companies that build platforms or for, for software developers, for content creators, for schools, for policymakers, all of these things. Um, but I know a bunch of the folks in the audience are educators themselves, they're education administrators, they're making decisions about whether this is technology that's ready for the classroom. Um, and I know each of you are, are deploying technology like this in educational settings today. And so I'd love to you know, move from the why, what are the challenges and what can be hard to, what do I need to know if I'm an education administrator today and I'm interested in this? What does it look like to deploy it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the thing that we see is you need to be able to solve a real problem. So in our case, teaching skills like crossing the street or take something trickier like a law enforcement encounter for someone on the autism spectrum in their teenage years and their ability to navigate that in the environment we live in today. So really tricky, hard to simulate situations that VR is uniquely capable of teaching better than anything else. In randomized control trials that we ran with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, you know, twice the effect in gaining the skill minute for minute to the best treatments out there right now that are video or in-person based to train compared to what we're able to do. So the potential is huge to speed up learning and speed it up in skills that can, in this case, be potentially life and death. Yeah, I, actually, I, I'm really glad you talked about um, outcomes because I think uh, I said some of this on a panel yesterday, but um, part of what's been uh, really exhilarating for us is that even though we know we're just kind of getting started, the outcomes have been really astonishing. And in a way that there's some kind of magic that, um, uh, and it's not because we've gotten it all right, it's that this is enabling educators to situate students in ways relative to content, relative to each other, that we've never been able to do before, and it's capturing the imagination of students um, in really, really profound ways. And so, you know, at ASU where we've done now a few thousand students have gone through this intro biology program that's quite unusual. Um, the outcomes were really, really amazing with um, student, the complete, clo or just about complete closing of achievement gaps between high and low performing demographic groups. Students just about two times as likely to get an A in lab even though it's way more, um, uh, more sophisticated quantitatively than what they were asked to do in business as usual. And like that, like I guess what I would say to the, um, the educators that are afraid of the last 20 minutes of this conversation is just go, just, just start doing stuff because you're going to find your way to things that are really worth supporting and you're gonna figure out how to solve the, the sort of you know, logistical complexities around it. So you, you just said something that I think is, and, and you kind of jumped over it, but it's really powerful, which is outcomes that are closing the achievement gap. Um, can you talk to us more about that? What does that, mean? What does that mean in practice, and, and, and how do you attribute those kinds of outcomes? Like, what's causing? Well, I mean, for us, it's, it's a very specific thing, but so we did uh, last spring um, a very well-designed, uh, randomly controlled uh, trial where 450 students did Dreamscape Learns Biology in the Alien Zoo, and 400 uh, matched demographically, demographically matched group of students did sort of business-as-usual biology lab. 
um, and where the, I think the, the difference in performance in, in historically in business as usual uh, between the highest performing demographic group and the lowest was about 42%. It became 5% um, in, after this semester. And I totally know what to attribute it to, and it's actually only partially the VR. It's that the whole thing is a really compelling cinematic narrative where the students are the, uh, are the heroes of the journey. And, you know, we, we know what people can't resist in terms of mediated experiences. Great stories that have twists and turns and, um, and cliffhangers and false starts and all the rest of it. And for some reason, we find lots of ways in school to really avoid creating narrative in curriculum. And, um, and so I think once students feel like they're um, emotionally, not just engaged, but like compelled to solve a problem and have a, the, the bit in their mouth in the way they do and all kinds of other things that they do um, in their non-school lives, they're willing to do incredibly hard work to kind of get to the next episode in the story. And, um, and so, you know, for us, we're really focused on how do we bring that, those kind of story structures to curriculum um, so that the, the learning is almost um, uh, happenstance. Yeah, and I think to add to that, um, on the teacher side, I mean, we've worked with almost, so far, maybe almost 10,000 teachers who we have trained um, on the VR side of things. And to anyone that's a school leader here, like, teachers want to have be at the cutting edge. Teachers want to pioneer these new things because they know that, they know how hard it is to engage a student and really immerse them and build that deep sense of curiosity for learning. Um, and so there is, if you take a bottom-up outlook to this, um, both students and teachers are primed. I think the timing is right to really kind of look at bringing these sorts of experiences into um, the classroom. But to kind of what Michael said in the beginning, like there is early, very promising evidence on outcomes. And in order to have sustained long-term use, we have to ensure that we can actually continue to replicate and demonstrate longitudinal work um, on the outcome side of things. Because Michael is absolutely right in that for as many studies that show VR improves learning, there are studies that also show that it does not. Um, and um, that's largely because of also limited experimental setups and designs, um, uh, challenges with the form factor of a lot of the hardware is also that, that model of like, well, let's do VR for VR's sake because it's cool, because it has this novelty or this, this wow factor to it. And, and we're learning. I think there's a lot of this new wave of um, a more grounded, rigorous approach to thinking about integration, which makes this very promising. For the first 25 districts um, that we work with, for each one, we insisted that they actually also carved out a research study or a white paper because they need to see the evidence of it working in their classrooms for their students um, um, so that it's not something that looks like, oh yeah, we did this study in this lab, but it was an actual in-class longitudinal experiment for their own students, um, for their demographics, which would be very unique to where they're from, and that incentivizes sustainable and sustained use um, in the long term. That, that, that's really exciting, and I'm glad to hear that, that that work is going on, because I think, you know, one of the things that, that we can look at is we're having positive near-term outcomes, and then understanding the longitudinal outcomes is going to be really, really critical. So I, I know we're almost out of time, and Emily, maybe I can start with you, but I, I'd love to do a little bit of a lightning round. So we've talked about the, the future that we're hoping to create. We've talked about what it takes to get there. Um, Emily, what are you most optimistic about when you think about this space and the future of what it can do for education? What's the thing that keeps you going? Many things today. <laughs> Honestly, teachers keep me going these days. Um, no, I'm just really excited to see what they're going to actually make with those tools. When, you know, the more we can get these tools into the hands of teachers, I'm just excited to see what they take on and what they do with it. I'm excited for the new generations that are going to come and that are going to be using these things and how it's going to change and how they're learning and their outcomes. I'm, I'm just really you know, bullish about that future and doing that work now already. You know, if you haven't tried VR with your students yet, well, do it. Just give it a try, and, and you'll see it's going to be pretty fun, interesting, and sometimes frustrating. Vijay, what about you? Well, I mean, I think the, probably the biggest, especially in this context of kids who receive therapy, the kids love it. They enjoy it. They're so engaged, and that means everything, um, especially in the community that we're serving where Kids are potentially you know, receiving thousands of hours of therapy. It's grinding. And here, we've introduced something fun. Like, as far as a true north of building something that they want to do, we'll get the content right over time. We'll figure out all these onboarding issues. But like, the kids really enjoy the medium. 
And actually, to pick up on that, like part of what they just enjoy is it's not that hard for us to build things in VR that are just breathtakingly beautiful. And you don't have to spend a lot of time in schools to realize like students don't spend a lot of time in beautiful environments in a lot of our schools. And if suddenly they can be on the lunar surface or down in front of the Great Barrier Reef or in a beautiful cathedral, like it's just breathtaking in a way that um, most of what school is isn't. And um, anyway, so to me, that's, that's a large part of what is um, igniting. Yeah, I think saying that, that education can be fun and beautiful? How weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the last two decades of education technology focused largely on solving the access problem. Like, how do we get people access to online videos or online lessons or whatever, but we ignored the quality and the experiential dimension. Um, it blows my mind that most online video content is just taking the same teacher writing on a whiteboard and replicating that with a digital whiteboard of somebody writing and using their voiceover to talk over it, which works in certain use cases, but the world of digital learning unlocks opportunities to do things that were impossible, and I don't want us to fall into that pitfall of just replicating digital classrooms again in VR, but really pushing the needle forward and building spaces that are joyful, that are fun, that inspire that form of curiosity and learning. Yeah, and I can say at, at Labster, our core mission is to provide equal access to high, high quality education for everyone anywhere in the world. And I think this is the technology that's truly going to enable that. And if we think of the Gartner hype cycle, I think we went through a wild journey with VR and we went down to a dip. And I feel like we're finally now getting to the journey where adoption is starting to happening. Uh, we see the excitement from both educators and students, certainly still challenges to overcome, but, but we are on that positive upwards trend um, with a, a sustainable upwards trend, as I see it. So that I'm very excited about. Well, I mean, it's a really, I'm coming out of this panel actually really inspired by the work that all of you are doing and, and, and sort of the moment that we're in right now. Because going back to the sort of idea, the, the moment where we introduce computers into the classroom and use that as a tool for education, it feels like we're on the cusp of that next big jump. And it's really, really exciting. I think there's like lots of questions to answer and lots of things to build. Um, it's going to take all of these different parts of the community. It's going to take everybody up here and actually all of you who, who, who have come to this conversation and we're going to have to work on building this together. So I'm, I'm super excited about the promise of that and what we can build for education and just excited about the journey together. So thanks to everyone on the panel and thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.